uh, be happy to introduce Courtney Muma for those of you who don't know her. And we're going to talk about NDSA levels and considering different tiers of commitment for various content types. And Courtney's going to lead us in a discussion. So thank you, Courtney. Yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, we have a new member, the Berkeley Library at University of California. Uh, they were just approved uh, last week. Um, and then uh, Leah, you can you can feel free to add uh, some more updates on top here. But I think the probably the most important one, uh, of course, everybody who's on the call knows uh, we have a new password. Uh, you had to use it to to get in. Um, and from DLF and Clear, uh, just so you know, folks know, um, it's almost definite that um, most of us who are chairs of the interest groups, it shouldn't. Uh, Nobody should imply that to mean that we'll definitely be convening the calls as hosts necessarily um, under DLF for these these calls. Um, so uh, if for whatever reason we get uh, zoom bombed or interrupted at any point, you know, during these calls, um, the protocol that um, the leadership team is encouraging us to follow is just for everybody. Don't don't wait for a host to stop the call um, or reconvene the call. Just go ahead and hop off. Um, but, right, Leah. Yeah, we talked about different, uh, tr the, the trick is trying to balance the ease of connection by having DLF be the host for all of the meetings. And then obviously a responsiveness if, if somebody inappropriate were to get on the call. And originally they were gonna have the password included in, um, in all of the notices about the meetings and then uh, the decision was made not to do that because apparently that's how Zoom bombers have been getting information about meetings to get into is in, through public announcements about meetings. So, so instead, we will be giving that password information pretty much every time we send out an announcement about the meeting. And so that was, that was kind of the, the compromise, although certainly somebody still could get a hold of that password and zoom bomb a meeting and if so the idea was for Matt or I or any, actually anybody who is on it as soon as you see something just just get onto the meeting and say everybody should get off of the meeting right now because originally the idea was that we would contact DLF who was pretty responsive and could respond within a matter of minutes but it, uh, everyone felt that that might even still be too long so that's that's how we're going to try it. If it still doesn't seem to be enough, then DLF will reconsider the idea. So if anybody has any thoughts about that, uh, happy to hear, hear about them. And I think DLF would be definitely happy to hear about it as we go forward and see how this works. Yeah, and I think those were those were the two main things that I wanted to be sure to cover at the top. Um, yeah. And yeah, we can, we can segue right over to you, Courtney, and you can get us started in this conversation. Go ahead and set us up. And Courtney, are you able? To, are you able to hear me? Okay. Yeah, my internet is being spotty. Of course, now when I need it not to be, <laughs> it's been fine all day. So I'm shutting down some things in, in the background. So just give me a sec. Um, I blame Microsoft. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you good. Um, yeah, I can hear you really well. Oh, I um uh. In the background, uh, Carol is alerting me. Uh, we have two sort of historic um, versions of notes um, that are, you know, sort of a, a technical um, hangover from when we made the transition from Nathan's tenure over to our tenure, um, copies of notes. Um, while Courtney's getting started, I'm going to make sure that we have access to the more authoritative set of notes um, for the interest group, and I'll get that plugged into the chat. Um, Courtney, you should feel free to just kind of get started. Folks will get access to the to the record okay. after. Yoki. Um, so yeah, if Memphis jumps into the background and starts licking his bum, that's not a Zoom bomber. <laughs> 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 but it is likely. <laughs> um, so I've had to reposition myself a bit onto my floor, which is the place that I've found in my living room works the best on these larger Zoom meetings. Um, so you get a little bit more view of my living room. Um, so I was invited to have to host this discussion today because I suggested it. So that's what you get, folks. If you suggest a conversation you want to have um, in this NDSA infrastructure group, 
um, then be ready to lead it. And luckily, this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, and so I'm happy to lead this discussion. So what I'm going to do is just kind of introduce the kinds of things I'm thinking about in terms of using specifically the new version of the levels of preservation to think about tiered approaches to digital preservation. And in particular, I'll focus a little more on storage because that's something I think quite a lot about. Um, and then I want to open it up to a discussion of how some of you have done that. I'm happy to see that Texas A&M, Sean Buckner is with us today. And I know that Texas A&M has taken a, an approach like that, although not necessarily aligned with the levels yet. Um, and then I just want to hear some ideas about um, how you can see them kind of working in your institution to help make some decisions around software and storage infrastructure, particularly in terms of how you're approaching digital preservation. Um, I'm going to be looking at my notes, not the chat. <laughs> so if Leah or Matt could interrupt me, if anybody um, wants to interrupt and ask a question in chat. Um, I'm super informal. Those of you who know me know that by now. So please feel free to jump in um, or just unmute yourself and say, hey, Courtney, excuse me for a sec. I'd love to hear from you then too. So um, I'm going to give just a little bit of an overview. Basically, I feel like the update of the levels of preservation that we've recently done really gives us another opportunity to start reevaluating how we're using them to both assess our current state of being in digital preservation planning, and then also plan for changes in each of the functional areas and thinking about how they overlap. Um, I think the levels are really handy for establishing a baseline, um, but I think that they have been used most typically when I've seen them used for assessment. They've been used to do one assessment of a program rather than looking at different elements of a program and applying the levels to each of those elements or functional areas. Um, so I want to back up a little bit. So in Texas, the Texas Digital Library, um, we are a consortium of mostly academic libraries in Texas. There are 25 of us now. Um, and we host a lot of different things. We host repositories, we host an electronic theses and dis dissertation management system that we also develop. Um, we host open journal systems. Um, we also have a data repository and we started with digital preservation services um, about five years ago. And then I came on board after that digital preservation service had been around for about a year and a half or almost two years. So the model at TDL uses DuraCloud, but we host it ourselves. Um, and what we have are options in terms of storage infrastructure that you access through DuraCloud. And the idea behind that, which I've refined a bit since I started at TDL, um, is that you should be able to make decisions about your content that differ in different situations. So some content would go into one form of storage through Dura Cloud, but another set of content would go through perhaps a more robust system like Chronopolis, which is something that we offer. So when I first came to TDL, I wasn't the, the deputy director yet. Um, I was brought in specifically to manage the digital preservation service and the data repository service. And so I really took on the digital preservation service um, with a lot of ideas about how to engage folks. And I used immediately the levels um, as an engagement tool with the 22 members at the time of TDL. Um, and what I did first was I went around and did individual assessments with each of our members. And I've actually talked about that in this meeting in the past. There's a recording of that conversation if you're interested in how I went through doing that. Um, but basically what I, were see what I was seeing in Texas when I had the conversations leading to those assessments was that people weren't really ready for digital preservation in terms of their local policy, their workflows, their procedures. They were also kind of paralyzed um, about selecting software and systems that were out there. 
And then there was also this odd sort of shame response about their own institutional progress where they were hesitant to even share with a user group in Texas because of this feeling that, that they were so far behind everyone else. And so one of the great things that doing the levels assessment in Texas using version one um, kind of helped to level the, the playing field here. Um, I had hoped that it would, would show institutions in Texas that large and small institutions were all struggling with many of the same issues and that then folks would be able and more willing to share and engage with each other. And it actually worked quite a bit and it did encourage more engagement and commitment and our digital preservation service membership went up and then the crash of Deepin happened. Um, and so I can't see your faces, but I'm hoping I'm seeing a lot of nods and understanding looks. So when the digital preservation network crashed um, and disappeared, um, we lost a lot of momentum. And I think that's true for a lot of folks who are offering digital preservation services. Um, Luckily, we had gained some momentum shortly before that, so it didn't hurt us that bad. Um, but there was an impact across the whole community. I'm sure you all are still feeling it, and especially to member-based services like ours in Texas as a consortium. Even though when DeepN went away, all the content was safely moved to another storage option or restored to the user, there was still just that overall feeling of, what's the point? <laughs> So when it came time to update the levels and move on to a levels 2.0, I was really excited to engage with that because I knew the power that the assessment of Texas institutions using level one did. And part of my objective in helping to edit the levels and create levels um, 2.0 was to really help reinvigorate and engage, especially with those institutions that I had observed as really paralyzed by indecision in Texas. Um, indecision and kind of like actually an avalanche of decisions that they have to make about all of their different content and needs and systems and strategies, um, just being generally overwhelmed by the thought of it all. One great thing about the new levels of preservation um, is that we simplified quite a bit of the language and I think clarified distinguishing characteristics of each level so that it's just a lot more understandable what what is actually advancing in terms from level to level and so what i'm hoping to see is that institutions especially those of us in texas um, who i work with directly start using the new levels to assess and then define their commitment in each of the functional areas to create their own documented tiers of preservation. So um, I'm not gonna go through all of the functional areas. This is not a deep dive into the levels of preservation. Um, we all have access to that and I hope you've all had an opportunity already to take a look at the levels 2.0. And I kind of wanna focus on the storage functional area just to start this conversation. Um, so, if an institution is doing an assessment, they're looking at the functional area. Um, they've got levels one through four then as kind of the basis for thinking around what is our local institutional tiered approach to digital preservation storage decisions. Um, but you could do this for any functional area, not just storage. And in fact, you could define your tiers using every functional area, you could say tier one is storage level one, control level three, you know, X, Y, Z, going through all of that. And then you have a really basic understanding of what the requirements are for that tier of preservation in your institution. I also think that, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, let me drink some water. Um, I also think, uh, I don't want to suggest that every institution necessarily needs four tiers. Um, so just because we're looking at levels one through four in each of these functional areas, I'm not saying that everyone needs four tiers. Some institutions might only need two tiers to distinguish their content needs in the way that they treat content in their digital preservation system. Um, and also, I think that each level could serve as more than one 
tier or serve to define more than one tier in that an institution could have a diversified approach to the same level, depending on what tier they're calling that and the criteria that they're using to define that tier internally. So again, the levels really give us all an opportunity to establish a, a baseline. And then that baseline, I suggest when you do your initial assessment, that baseline could, could serve in some cases as a rough draft of defining your first tier. So you could say, here's our current assessment. And even though we're between levels maybe one and two or one, two and three um, in most of the levels, um, maybe that's okay for some of your content. And then right there, you've got, this is our first tier. And then you could define, okay, what's the set of content that we would need to get up to level four in storage and level three in metadata. And then that could be another tier and that's the tier that you would be working towards. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different combinations that you could do here. So I'm not gonna go through too many of them, but just as an example, that's one of the ways you could start thinking about it. Um, I know that some institutions are doing this. Um, like I mentioned, um, Texas A&M has tiers of preservation. It's a tiered approach um, where their kind of most institutionally valuable content is treated with like their top level creme de la creme digital preservation strategy. It doesn't necessarily align with the levels, but it wouldn't take much, I don't think, to do an assessment and see how their tiers do align with those levels. Sean, if you want to do that project with me, I'm open to it. Okay. <laughs> um, but I would really be interested in seeing how institutions start applying this idea and whether this idea is interesting to them. Um, as I said before, I think what I've seen is assessments that are done on the whole system as if your digital preservation strategy is one strategy. And I just don't think that that's necessarily the way that's sustainable, especially if we start looking at storage. Um, if we look at that functional area for storage, it's kind of unsustainable and unattainable for most institutions to be at level four for all of their content. Um, even the content that they have acknowledged requires digital preservation <coughs> treatment. Um, also, if we begin to take more seriously, which I hope we do, the impact of our preservation decisions on the environment, then we should really think of that topmost tier as really only for that topmost set, that most valuable set of content, that most unique set of content in our institution, and then everything else assigned to buckets at lower levels. So um, I think that covers most of our, how I wanted to just start the conversation here. But I think generally I want us to focus, to shift the kind of digital preservation focus and discussions we're having to setting up those different tiers based on really honest assessments of what, what we're currently doing. That whole as is conversation that we often have about, let's see where we are, let's see where we wanna be. And I think that guidelines for tiers at the beginning after you do an initial assessment should stay relatively straightforward using the levels as big buckets. And then for instance, zeroing in more on once you've assigned the different tiers and created some criteria for them on expanding on the requirements and helping understand what and why goes into those buckets. Um, in terms of the what and why things go into those buckets, I encourage engaging archivists and librarians and subjects experts who understand the levels and also have experience looking at their own institutional priorities and inventories to make appraisal and selection decisions, so especially your archivists and other professionals who have worked in appraisal and selection in the past. I think those are important conversations to have concerning what goes into each tier. And then I think that those decisions that are made should be included in acquisition and collection policies so that we avoid a situation where now where a lot of us 
when we're making these assessments and looking at our inventories and setting priorities for preservation, we're looking at backlogs. We're not necessarily even at the point in many cases at looking at what's coming in and making a decision upon acquisition um, about where it's going to go in our digital preservation priorities. But then once you focus in, after you start with the big buckets, think around what goes into which bucket, then you focus in on the functional areas and come up with your actual tactics and so for instance if you're looking at the storage functional area you've set up your tiers you've set up most of your um, criteria for being put into one of those tiers and then use something like the storage criteria um, for figuring out what the criteria are for the actual systems that you purchase or implement and I think you could apply other kinds of standards and criteria to each of the different levels as you move through this process. And so that's all I wanted to say to start the conversation. Um, these are things I think about a lot. So I apologize if I just kind of like vomited a ton on you. Um, <laughs> but I would really like to hear your thoughts about this. I want to hear who's doing, who's doing this kind of tiered approach, how you're making those decisions, um, who was involved in making those decisions, um, and just how, if at all, you are or would like to see this applied in your own institution. That's all I got. So, um, because most everybody does not have their camera on, why don't we use the raised hand function, if everybody's okay with that, uh, to try to have a, try not to talk over each other. Uh, so I see Nathan. Hi, uh, thanks, Leah, um, and thank you, Courtney. The, a lot of what you said resonates with me um, and uh, what I'm trying to establish at Penn State. Um, we do have some draft levels of preservation commitment that um, right now, because they're sort of in a high level policy, they, they aren't as um, specific in how they relate to the NDSA levels and are a bit more uh, broad with the thought being as we get to uh, an implementation phase, the additional details go in around them. Um, but I wanted to um, comment or question on, you know, this, this, uh, the idea that, uh, you know, you, even within one strategy or one level, functional level, there could be different strategies, you know, based on the, the um, value of the content and the, the hardware mixture and so forth. It seems like uh, to have such a complex routing, um, a lot would hinge upon a management system that allows you to specify through metadata um, at the collection, object, and or even file level, um, you know, what particular pathway things are supposed to follow um, and be directed through the, the appropriate channels for that um, tier level of preservation. Um, and I was curious if you had a response to that or if you think, you know, you don't really need that, you know, you can really just get by with a, a tracking spreadsheet or, you know, um, some ways people could go about starting, uh, setting up those, um, not, if not fully automated, but um, routines to get content flowing into those systems. Also thinking back to your earlier comment about uh, how you engaged with the community user group in Texas and everyone's still sort of figuring out how to, what, what to put in. Thank you. Yeah, I love your mind, Nathan, because you always jump right to the, how do we automate this technologically? <laughs> but um, I, I always start with the manual. Um, and so I really, I think so much comes down to policy and procedure. And I think one of the huge benefits of the levels, especially this newer version, is it is simplified and it's clear. And I think you can, um, I think a lot of places, one of the reasons they're behind in terms of policy procedure and workflow um, is because of that paralysis and not really knowing where to start. And this matrix that we have gives us a really good framework for just big bucket assignments of tier requirements. And then after that point, you know, it's just going to take, I think, people working together better. That's why I thought it was important to bring up that you need to engage with expertise in your institution beyond single departments. Um, with TDL, I often do consultations with institutions who 
the special collections or a section of the library or the archives has thought about their preservation needs and that's why they've engaged with me. But then we'll have a much larger discussion with um, a group from the rest of the library and sometimes some of the graduate schools and we'll hear, oh, we've got this stuff too. What do we do with that? And I think that's the nice thing about a consortium and the kind of shared responsibility and shared resources model is that allows us to broaden the viewpoint and broaden that perspective and start thinking about how to bring in more voices so that there is a workflow that makes sense for all of the content that potentially needs to be preserved. So Courtney, this is Leah, um, I have a couple thoughts. A, a, a couple of times in, in when you were speaking, it reminded me of some of the conversations that we've had around the in the curatorial subgroup in trying to define a workflow uh, for curators around digital preservation. And I, I could see um, the conversation that you're envisioning around tiers sort of interfacing with that curatorial uh, workflow process. And I, I think one of the reasons that I was thinking about that is because I tend to think about um, processes like this from the perspective of a smaller institution rather than a larger institution. And I can imagine, which I think you kind of just alluded to in your consortia, um, I can imagine um, staff at, at smaller institutions who don't have the collections to look at from a big bucket kind of perspective, um, also still being afraid to think about tiers and maybe looking for guidance in sort of the same way in the curatorial group. You know, we did the, the written document, but we also did a, a work sort of workflow decision chart. And it seems like that kind of thing, if possible, could be helpful for institutions to, to, to sort of say, do you have this? If so, then do you have this? And if so, that suggests that maybe these are materials that don't require the highest level of the levels, but maybe you could be on a level two and you would be fine. You know, I, I think that there are probably a significant number of uh, institutions or individuals within institutions who might need that kind of guidance. Do you, do you see that working with the consortium that you're in? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I wanted to have this conversation because what I wanna see are more examples because mm -hmm. that's the thing that really kind of, that, that's what I have seen spurs on, especially those smaller, smaller institutions who maybe only need two buckets. Yeah, exactly, uh, yep. <laughs> but they need to see examples um, of what other people are doing and, um, and so I would just like to see more of that, more examples of this actually being applied to make these kinds of decisions. Um, because I can help people do it, and that's what I'm here for in Texas. But the truth is people don't take advantage of that consulting as much yeah. as I would like them to because of that paralysis. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can totally see that. I can totally understand that. And you're right, maybe maybe with more examples, there would almost be a consensus that would emerge on its own about uh, certain parameters of materials and where they belong within the levels. There may be that everybody kind of comes to the same conclusion. Yeah. Yep. Okay, let's see. Anybody want to raise their hand? Other questions for Courtney or comments or thoughts? Uh, let's see. Nathan gave a shameless plug <laughs> in the chat. His words, not mine. Uh, Nathan, do you want to talk a little bit about what that link goes to? Sure. Um, that's a, a this link goes to a, a paper that Lauren Work from UVA and I gave at IPRES um, a couple of years ago, where Courtney was chair, I believe, um, on the program committee. Uh, it, it's talks about selection and appraisal for digital preservation and it tries to uh, form a model based on sort of how we've done this in analog for both general and special collections and sort of taking um, sort of a, 
I don't think we had like 20 or some different models that we combined and sort of weighed against each other to come up with a model of selection for digital preservation. But we also introduced some um, related factors that are sometimes hard to, to quantify. Um, a lot of it comes down to value. Um, you know, and value is determined best by the collection stewards and the selectors and the people who are in charge of those. And too often, you know, they look to the digital preservation person, you know, to figure out where stuff needs to go. But we're really not the content experts here. And, you know, we can advise on the technical side of things, you know, and what the implications are for some of those decisions. Um, so this was tried to, to put a framework around it that sort of balanced the, the sort of traditional collection aspects as well as the um, more technical issues. Um, the thoughts being that this could be something you use in your institution to have those conversations and to give guidance and tools to selection managers to actually assign those levels that Courtney is talking about and make those appraisal decisions so that it's not in the vacuum and at the end of the day, you know, if it's just sort of left up to one person who's not an expert there. And, and really it's collections management. And in some ways it does put the onus back on those collection stewards, um, you know, which I think is probably the best way to look at it because collections management or preservation is a function of collections management. Um, I know Lauren and I are hoping to pick this back up to introduce some more concepts like web archives, email and post custodial archive situations. So there might be a future version of that on the way. Yeah, again, it sounds like you're what you're saying again is um, suggesting that interaction and overlay or um, some sort of um, interaction again with the curatorial um, process, which, yeah, is, is sort of what I, I was feeling was was being said. I, um, you know, I can I can say from my perspective, because where I am, I am both responsible for our special collections as well as our digital initiatives. So I, I can wear those two hats of content and, and technical. And so I almost have the luxury of sort of being able to make those decisions, but have not codified them at all. And so I think that that's one of the uh, challenges and one of the things that um, a smaller institution could perhaps contribute to the process is the fact that uh, I already have a sense of what collections need what levels and what in what areas but I just have not had to actually write it down and it would be great to actually do that especially if it would be useful for others I would love it. That's exactly what I want. So yeah. badly. selfishly, so badly. That's what I want. I also shared, um, just following up on Nathan's um, excellent paper um, with Lauren. Um, I, I, uh, there's a doc I use in Texas to work with institutions here to kind of inventory and then make decisions about digital preservation priorities. Um, this is a document that it goes way back to when I was art at Artifactual Systems in Canada. Um, and then it, it morphed into something different when Grant Hurley got a hold of it, um, when he started working on uh, permafrost up in uh, Toronto and the rest of Ontario. Um, and then I took it back and worked more on it and use it in Texas. <laughs> so um, it's a handy tool and it's meant to be adapted, but it is really helpful in terms of when you're thinking around the content and you're thinking what goes into those tiers that you've decided upon, um, then you start really narrowing into what the criteria are for those, those tiers. We will make sure that we put those links in the minutes for uh, the meeting today. So if you don't get them out of the chat, we'll definitely get them uh, into the minutes. So Matt has his hand raised. Yeah, Courtney, thank you so much for, for this. Um, I wonder if you, um, you know, in your interactions with the folks in TDL or, you know, any other folks on the call here who've had a chance to engage with um, the new levels a bit more, um, if they're finding that the levels are 
um, proving to uh, help them cut through some of the paralysis around um, large scale collections, um, audio video collections. If you're, if it's, if it's helping people sort of pragmatically solve like the time scale for um, addressing, you know, um, distribution for that, that heavy content, um, you know, or just what, what sort of approaches people are taking now that they have this, you know, this really flexible tool to help them think a little bit more um, flexibly around, around solving those sorts of issues. And While you're waiting, had, yeah, there you go. While you're waiting, Matt, um, I do know that um, I don't know if anyone is here from University of Houston, but I know that they're starting to look at the the new version of the levels, mm -hmm. um, and starting to do an assessment locally using those. Because of that, I think that we're going to do another push in Texas, um, looking at level two. So you'll you'll be hearing more from at least our group in Texas about that. Okay, great. So I'm curious, let's see, I want to make sure nobody, no hands raised. So I'm curious if this raises to um, a need or an interest in, in something like a, a working group to start to put together, I guess, with, would be case studies of uh, institutions that have started to think about this. Is that something that, Courtney, you thought maybe might be a way to approach this? I would love to do that with a partner. I don't have the bandwidth to do it on my own, but if someone wanted to work on it with me, then I'd be happy to. I, I would be interested in uh, pursuing this. Are there other people who, who think that this is a, a useful way to attack this question uh, through a smaller working group? Any thoughts that anybody has? We'd love to hear them. I'm not sure how to raise my hand here in this one, but okay, I'm also wondering, <laughs> <laughs> this is Dan at OSU. I'm wondering if that's also part and parcel to the role of the, the new group that's being spun up around the levels um, in regards to outreach and education, if that's something that falls into potentially their remit. And I believe it's gonna be, um, Nancy McGovern, I forget who tabbed as co-chair for that. I don't know if Courtney or Carol. Carol, you are, aren't you? No, nope, Jen Mitchum. Oh, oh, okay. All right, sorry. Didn't mean to. <laughs> nope, no problem. Or something. Uh, yeah, long. so that, that might be a good discussion to have uh, with them about whether this crosses over into areas that they were planning on going. So I can speak to that a little bit, Leah. Um, okay. The, uh, I think they have sort of selected a name and it's escaping me right now, um, advocacy and outreach, something like that. What the goal is sort of for that group um, is coming up with is, is similar to the depot program, um, the digital preservation outreach uh, education, where they're going to be developing some modules um, that are sort of, you know, out there in the community that people can then pick up to do workshops or to tutorials um, or maybe suggest some lines of inquiry along those, those lines. And, and that's going to be sort of initially maybe a six month or so group that gets this corpus of material together. Um, but then there might be a second um, wave, so to speak, of uh, is this just something there or does it you know do we expand into a train the trainer sort of thing like depot actually did or is this just a resource um related to that i've been trying to sort of instigate a um workshop for digiprez on using um some of the supplemental materials that came out with the new version of the levels like the implementation guide and the assessment uh, tool um and perhaps if there's there's interest you know, jointly developing um, a proposal for DigiPres where maybe a working group like this could be um, kicked off. And of course, that could be a separate process, but curious if, if there's interest in that. It's 
So Leah, I raised my hand, so I'm going to jump in. Hey, great, Carol. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know how many people you can see at a time, but um, to add to kind of add on to what Nathan and Dan have said is that there's the teaching or whatever the group's called teaching and advocacy or advocacy teaching um, group for the levels of preservation but there's also kind of the levels of preservation steering ish group which does want to have some sort of understanding of what is being done around the levels of preservation so if a working group like this was to start up i think that group should know about it so there isn't duplication of efforts, which I think is what Dan was also probably trying to say that it might fit into that other group. So because we don't want to have two different groups doing the same thing because we're all busy. <laughs> Absolutely. I think and I, I you know, I'm yeah, I'm a little unclear um, being new to to chairing one of these groups, you know, what the what the lines of communication are so certainly any um suggestions and and advice on how to make sure the right people know that things are happening is is greatly appreciated yeah and and this kind of steering committee type thing is definitely very new um and it's just because the levels was so big yeah um but it's definitely something um that we can take back to that group if there's interest which it sounds like there is and um, the best way to do it are, are is anybody here a member of that steering group i am nathan oh, are okay. you or not i am yeah okay so between the two of you is it something that you could you know broach as at least an idea of something that we'd like to to move forward on just to uh, it might be good to have a little, um, usually the working groups, you know, have deliverables, they're time bound, um, and, and generally the leadership team sort of vets new working groups because they're overall trying to sort of coordinate NDSA activities and make sure they align to things like the national strategy. Okay. Um, it, it, uh, it might be helpful to maybe flesh some of this out into just a you know one page sort of document you know as to what the goal would be um to to help give some momentum there and for people have something more specific to to respond to um nance and jen's group i think they're going to be calling for reviewers i think that they have enough people to do the initial um sort of drafting of equipment but i mean uh, if that's something you're really interested in, Courtney, you might just send them a line. I, I think probably also as far as a one page sort of this is what we talked about at the at this interest group meeting and this is kind of what percolated as an idea to move forward. I think we can probably do that. Okay, let's see any other thoughts about any of this i'm not seeing any hands or at this point just jump in if you if you'd like to we're, we're not having we're not speaking over each other so i don't think it's a problem <laughs> okay um if not matt were there other things that we we probably need to talk about our meeting for May? Yeah, I think we're, um, you know, if we're following the, can folks hear me okay? Can you hear me okay, Leah? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, if, folk, um, if folks recall um, the, and for those of you who've been attending the infrastructure interest group calls uh, for quite some time now, I think um, most folks are used to this, but uh, Nathan and uh, Corey had set up a, um, a nice practice of just using uh, some point throughout each quarter of the year, just kind of a, an opportunity to check in with everybody to see what uh, topics they want to cover in the next phase of things. So um, I think we're on track, uh, unless Leah, you have some some other ideas. Um, uh, I think we're on track yeah. just to have an open call uh, next month to uh, gather in some new fresh agenda items uh, and topics for, for the coming months. Um, so I'm, I'm on board for that if everyone else is. That works for me. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Yeah, so folks, um, just, uh, you know, in between now and um, the third week in May, um, just feel free to, you know, sit back and think about what it is that that um, is interest of interest to unpack and explore on uh, the general area of infrastructure. Um, and we'll get some topics queued up and we may uh, do another poll uh, with folks just to see, you know, what trickles to the top. The voting system worked really well, I think. Um, and, I, you know, just uh, Courtney, uh, thanks again for working with us on the, the schedule to get you uh, on the agenda and everybody else um, over the course of this past, you know, first several months of the year, Nathan, Leah, um, this was really great so far putting together um, opportunities to hear from the folks who had some things that they proposed as topics um, coming into the, the new year. And we've managed to cover most of those. We've got some things that we can um, turn attention to uh, going back to that previous poll that was initiated by um, Nathan uh, for the infrastructure interest group. Um, uh, uh, things on the topics of uh, blockchain, uh, for example, for digital preservation. Um, I know we've got a few folks that attend these calls regularly that um, you know, are for lack of a better term, you know, sort of becoming experts in that area. So um, we've got some some names on the short list that we can turn to to, to queue up a topic in that area, for example, um, and a few others that we could go back to. Um, do folks have any particular topics that they want to share um, before we hit the top of the hour here? Anything that's on folks' radar that that we should um, potentially tee up? There's a question from Paul in the chat. Um, the previous call with Nathan was recorded and uh, we are gonna get that up on YouTube. Um, so, oh, yeah, sorry, so I, I thought it had been put up. Oh, we will yeah, definitely no, get it up there, yep. It's no problem, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll get that up and, and share it out. Um, I've already shared the link with our Meta Archive community to the, the Zoom link for Nathan's call, which was a great one. Um, Nathan, again, thanks for, um, and the, the live captioning was just, was pretty amazing. Um, so uh, it, it, when folks get a chance to rewind back and listen to his talk, it was uh, well worth it. Okay. Yeah, it's been it's been crazy. So we 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 have to ramp up to our new normal here. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks everybody for bearing with us um, and getting the agenda pulled together, and for you know um, the the note situation. Even uh, as soon as we hit the top of the call here, thanks for bearing with us getting getting the house in order, as it were. Um, so this was great. Courtney, I really just appreciated the, the, the casual conversation that you facilitated. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we, 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 weren't, we weren't Zoom bombed by your cat. <laughs> so yeah. we, we made it out alive. <laughs> this was great. Okay, well, everybody have a good rest of the month and um, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, uh, take care of yourselves, okay? Thanks, Courtney. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.